um, is that if you allow us to do the work the way that we believe the work should be done, um, and that includes um, not doing clinical documentation. Hey, this is Richard Zombeck, and you're listening to Buds with Suds. You can check us out on iTunes, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and Stitcher. If you are listening to us on iTunes, please rate us and leave us a comment or a review. It really does help us out. Also, if you'd like to leave us a voicemail, you can do that at 978-219-9554. Leave us a comment, suggestion, an insult. Uh, we'll play it on the next episode. So in this episode, I sat down with Keith Scott. He is the Vice President of Peer Support and Self-Advocacy at Advocates, and Keith is responsible for developing and overseeing peer support and self-advocacy for the entire organization, uh, along with oversight of all human rights mechanisms. Prior to his promotion in 2015, Keith worked uh, for Advocates. He's been there for 20 years. He worked in the mental health division uh, as a director, an administrative director, and a director of clinical services. The first time I heard him was at Governor Baker's Recovery Coach Commission. He was at, on a panel of employers, and the stuff that he was saying um, prompted me to make a call and ask him to be on the show. He agreed. I drove up to Framingham. We sat down for an hour, and here's the interview. Uh, Keith Scott, welcome to Buds with Suds. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, letting us have you, or, you know, however that goes. Um, you are at Advocates in Framingham. That's where, actually where we are now. I took a little road trip up here. And you're the VP of uh, Peer Support and Self-Advocacy. Can, can you just explain that title a little bit? And Sure. So... Um I am effectively responsible for uh, all of the services that we provide from the perspective of lived experience. Uh, that includes peer specialists with sort of psychiatric lived experience, uh, family partners who've had the experience of uh, raising a child who has special needs and uh, receives support in the system, and recovery coaches who are obviously providing support around people's uh, substance use and addiction issues. Um, I'm also responsible for all of the human rights mechanisms for the organization, um, irrespective of the service line. So we have autism services, brain injury, developmental services, and uh, behavioral health residential services in addition to our clinics. Um, and I'm responsible for all the human rights mechanisms for uh, those service lines. And, um, and part, of, uh, part of the other work that I do uh, around people with developmental and intellectual um, challenges specifically is uh, self-advocacy work. So I supervise our self-advocacy coordinator. And um, you know we have a number of initiatives that are trying to increase the autonomy and personal agency of uh, people with intellectual and developmental challenges as well. So. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously, because this is Buds with Suds, I, yeah. I'm going to talk more about the recovery end of it. Yeah. The first time um, that I knew anything about you was during uh, Charlie Baker's uh, Recovery Coach Commission in Boston, the one that Mary Lou Sutter is, is, uh, is uh, uh, leading up. And you were on the panel of, um, of employers, right, along Correct. with uh, uh, Chuck Weinstein from Partners, and there was another woman from Suffolk, I think, right? Yep, North Suffolk, yep. Yeah, and you had said a couple things. There was one, there was one longer one, but there, there, was, there was one um, particular incident, and I've got this, uh, I, I want to play the clip, uh, where, where, where you, you broke in and you had a couple things to say. Uh, so let me just play that real quick, and we'll talk about that on the other side. I, mean, I would just say quickly, you know, we, you know, you can negotiate this with third party. We, we've done it in, 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 one, in one situation. And I think you know, we've had conversations about the difference between documenting hours spent for the person and documenting content of activity and content of conversation. So I think we can continue to work on this in a way that will kind of meet the needs of, 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 of third party payers. And if you, if you sort of dilute this role so much that it's no longer what it is, then it's, what are you paying for? I mean, if, if the sort of the, what's valuable about and I mean, what's special about these roles is lost in, in the negotiation of, uh, of documentation, then is it really worth doing? Is, it, is a question I think that we ask ourselves all the time. Right. 
right. So that that was a that was a two or three weeks ago, I think. That, that sound about right. Yep. So hear, hearing that now, what do you what do you think? Well, I, I think I think very much the same now that I did that I did then. I, I think um, you know we've been having this conversation for a while in the sort of in the psychiatric recovery arena with our peer specialist teams and. Um, and uh, sort of the opportunities to integrate peer support more and more into the things that we do. Um, and that's, you know, that's coming not just from uh, state agencies, but it's also coming from private insurers now who are sort of catching on to the value of these kinds of supports. Um, and one of the things that we're talking about all the time is uh, this issue of documentation. How do, we, you know, how do we prove that we're doing what we're paid to be doing? Um, while at the same time adhering uh, very closely to the code of ethics for these positions, um, you know, one of which is about uh, preserving the, the, the privacy of the relationship and the trust it develops because of the privacy inherent in those kinds of relationships, um, the mutuality of the relationship. Um, once we start getting into documentation or clinical documentation of the work that we're doing and we're sharing the content of our conversations and the content of our activities with people, we really start to become more like traditional clinical staff with lived experience. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we, you know, we promote our clinical staff um, disclosing and sharing their lived experience because everybody has lived experience, right? The difference is these relationships um, in peer support, including recovery coaching, are, are, are based on the idea of mutuality um, and this connection that you can have with people which um, engenders an enormous amount of trust, which is really the basis for the good things that happen in the relationship. Uh, the trust allows people to tell us what's really on their mind, what, what they really want, what they really need, what they're really afraid of. Um, and I think so much of the work that gets done in human services is, um, is not honest, it's not transparent. People tend to be afraid to tell professionals what's really going on for fear that they will do something to them. Right, and I, and I think, I mean, that was the idea in the 70s, right, when all this came about with um, addictions counselors and things like that, and then adding licensure and, and all that to it. There was this feeling of, you know, it's like to catch a thief, right? Is, is someone, someone who's actually lived the experience, who's actually been there, is going to make a better uh, example or understand the issues probably more than someone else. And then they just started adding on to that and adding on to that and adding on to that. I have the, I have the very same fear, which is why I really like what you had to say, because, um, you know, I, I work as a, as, as a uh, recovery coach, and uh, part of the job is developing trust, right? And we continue to develop that trust. And then if we write about the stuff that we've been talking about or doing or sharing, then the next thing you know that it was an example I gave to to my organization is you know let's say I'm having a conversation with a guy and he wants to try meditation or he, you know he's not really big into AA and doesn't necessarily want to go to AA and I write that in the notes and I had this happen right I didn't write it in the notes but it came up as an example his therapist then is changed because the therapist that he's talking to leaves he's got a new therapist and she goes so how's the meditation going and that was a conversation that he and I had, right? right? And it was a conversation that we had as a result of a year's worth of developing trust. And he's a year sober, where no one thought he would even get a week, right? And he's moving along in his life, having, a, and all of a sudden, the trust is blown because Richard went and told everyone about uh, what we're talking about, right? Right. So, you know, getting back to your other point is, I'm a little skeptical uh, when. You know, I, I do understand that the that the insurance companies and, and that the billing and that they need to be shown value, but the, the, the value to them is monetary, right? So it's going to be, why are we paying for this and how is it working? And they're going to want to see how it works, right? But I'm not really sure that... Um, uh, like a treatment plan? Yeah, like a treatment plan or a wellness plan or things like that, right? Is how, how does that actually prove that we're making any progress, right? Because all it is, is is me filling out a piece of paper. And my fear on that is that the, you're gonna then have recovery coaches who are used to manipulating a system, right? Who are just gonna fill it out for the hell of it because that's how you get billed. And okay, great, it's proving, it's doing its thing. But I think we wanna work in, I mean, the whole idea, at least in a lot of 12-step recovery programs is, is an honest program, right? right. right. So <clears throat> you wanna try to be as honest and transparent as possible. But 
but I guess the question, and the question to you is, so, so how, do you, how do you prove that value without, um, without meeting the standards that have already been set for another, other fields in the same arena? Right. So I, I think part of the argument that we are making and, and have been trying to make consistently um, is that if you allow us to do the work the way that we believe the work should be done, um, and that includes um, not doing clinical documentation. Um, and, and part of the reason we don't, we, we don't do it, in addition to the thing that you just uh, alluded to, which is there's, there's a possibility that it just gets done for the sake of doing it. There's a possibility that, um, you know, uh, interventions are exaggerated, that, you know, you, that, 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 that the information contained therein is not wholly accurate or, or even helpful. Uh, there's also the issue that it's, it's a way of uh, demonstrating power over the people that we're supporting. The yeah. fact that, you know, that we can write something, that it goes into a chart uh, that other people have access to. The permanent record. Exactly, right. <laughs> so for, for us, it's, it's an unnecessary and even harmful demonstration of power um, which we're constantly trying to uh, eliminate. Obviously, we get paid to work with people, so there's not true mutuality that exists. But we want to make sure that we're eliminating every other potential barrier to mutuality that we can. And, uh, and, and writing notes and, and, and reading people's charts before meeting them and taking restraint training or crisis intervention training or functioning as a rep payee or administering medications or, you know, all of these things um, are demonstrations of power in ways um, in these relationships with people. And, and we've just found that um, that kind of power does not encourage trust and it doesn't encourage real meaningful conversation and it doesn't allow us to really find out what it is people want and need because they're so fearful that we're going to exercise power over them. I mean, that's been largely their experience. That's been largely my experience in the system. So. Um, that's the biggest reason. And I think our argument to our funders is, let us do this work the way that we feel has the most integrity. And, and you'll, you'll see, you'll see results. You'll see fewer hospitalizations. You'll see fewer ED visits. And, I, and again, I think that's what they're really paying for. Well, and I, and I think there, there were some statistics that, that BSAS had brought up, uh, at least uh, that, that they got from MGH, right? That there, was, there were 13% um, less ER visits. Uh, I think there were the percentage of PCP visits went up uh, also. I mean, that, that's, that's how we're, where I work, um, is how we're proving our worth. We're, we have a non-build model right now, mm -hmm. and the way that we prove the viability of that model is by exactly what you said. There are less ED visits. There are, there are more visits to PCP for, for just regular checks, right? Even people who never had a PCP now have a PCP that they can have regular visits with, right? That's all stuff that insurance is paying for. Same thing with possible therapy or um, MAT or whatever. All that stuff is, 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 are billable services, right? And, and if you can find a way, and I've talked about this too, is because Partners owns an insurance company. Mm -hmm. They should be the ones that are figuring out this model. They should be the ones that are blazing the trail because they have the Petri dish, right? And we can watch it right there in how they're doing it. Right. I mean, Mass Health is paying for it. I think what, what I'm a little concerned with, and correct me if I'm wrong, because my understanding is that Mass Health also has basically an end goal, right, where they want a specific amount of time, six months, a year, whatever, where some of these relationships can and may need to last for a lot longer than that, right? right. So if mass health has a cutoff time, right, again, what, what, what good is it doing? I mean, I understand that they can't bill in perpetuity, right. but they certainly bill five or six years for therapy. Yeah, I mean, our hope is that so some of these contracts that are time limited, um, they're sort of on an annual renewal. And I think as long as, and so this has been my experience, as long as we're demonstrating um, a sort of return on investment for, uh, for mass health or even for private insurers, um, you know, we believe that they'll continue to, to fund this because they see that it's achieving what they want, which is reduced costs while at the same time achieving what we want, which is, you know, enhancing people's agency, giving them the confidence to, you know, make decisions about their life, develop relationships outside the system that don't cost anything, you know, naturalized supports they're, they're generally referred to as. Um, 
so we we think that if you know if if we're allowed to do this work, um, that they'll be excited enough about the results that they'll continue to fund it. We're seeing that with a with a program that we operate. Um, that's again, it's it's peer specialists providing an environment that's completely peer supported for folks in psychiatric crisis as an alternative to going to the emergency room. And we've been keeping you know track of data since we started back in July, and that data is reflecting that people would prefer to go there, where it's completely voluntary. They don't surrender control of their life. Uh, they can take what they want and, and, and stay as long as they want or stay as, as little as they want. Um, that people respond to that kind of environment. They're, they're, they're more likely to come, they're more likely to ask for what it is that they want and need. Because uh, again, they, they don't fear that we're gonna do something to them and that we're gonna exercise power and authority over them. Wait a minute, that sounds a little revolutionary. People people actually respond better to having a choice. I know, right? <laughs> how, how long has it taken us to get to this point? That's not, that sounds a little socialist to me. Uh, no, I got no problem with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm with you. That's a whole other conversation and a whole different podcast, though. So here's the thing, right? I've been putting together this, um, this manual. Uh, not really a manual. It's kind of, I, I call it the recovery coach unofficial guide. And the hardest thing I've had coming up with is, you know, there's BSAS, there's Transcom, there's CCAR, is an, is an actual working definition of what a recovery coach is, right? And, and, here's, and here's the thing. So you go to these recovery coach commissions, and you have people sitting on panels, and they're asked questions. And the question always comes up, so what does a recovery coach do? And the pat answer is they, re they, they remove boundaries to recovery, right? But nine out of 10 of those people that are sitting on those panels, if you were to ask them to unpack that statement, to actually explain it, it would fall apart, right? And I have a hard time, and, and I'm, I'm a pretty articulate guy. I can, I can keep talking for an hour standing on my head, but I have a hard time explaining it, right? right? And we've talked about it on the show, too. It's like if anyone out from the outside were watching this, it's like, what does Richard really do all day? He goes to five Dunkin' Donuts, you know? He sits and talks to these people, and they come to his group on Tuesday nights and he talks about whatever because there's no format to the group. It's just kind of come in, we'll talk about it, let's see what's going on. But, but it's working, right? But how do you define that, particularly in a clinical setting, um, as to what a recovery coach, what's the role of a recovery coach? Right. So I think what, you know, one of the challenges, and I, th I think this was mentioned at the, at the Recovery Coach Commission panel uh, for providers um, and people who use uh, re recovery coaching is that it, it does seem to mean different things to different people. Uh, people define it differently. People operationalize it differently. There, you know, even on the panel, I remember there was a woman uh, sitting to my right who sort of felt like the role is different depending on the setting. That, you know, for instance, uh, we have recovery coaches, and I mean, you mentioned this earlier, we have reco recovery coaches who work in uh, emergency departments in a couple of hospitals in the Metro West area as part of a contract that we have. Um, and there was a belief that because they're involved in crisis work that they're more prescriptive in how they provide that support. And um, our, our position is the role doesn't change depending on setting, it's the same. And effectively it's about, you know, it's about meaningful connection around this shared lived experience idea. So to, to your earlier statement about someone who knows what it feels like, right, to, to struggle with substances, to, to end up in jail, to end up in detox time and time again, uh, to end up homeless in some, some cases. So the relationship is about connection around that shared lived experience as a starting point. Um, and then again, we focus on mutuality and trying to preserve as much mutuality in the relationship as possible, which means focusing on reducing anything that we do that sort of is emblematic of power over. That then allows us to, to have as much trust as I believe is possible in this kind of professional relationship. Um, because people know and believe that we won't do anything to them that they're not directing, they're not, they're not choosing for themselves. And we're really quite open about reinforcing that over and over and over again. Um, and then what that allows for is for people to kind of find their own way. Um, and we have no agenda when we come to the table. Again, there are some folks in the community, in the recovery community, who believe it's our job to actually coach people into recovery, to convince them that they need something, that right. they should go to AA or they should go to treatment or they should go to detox. And we don't do that because <clears throat> we don't feel like that's really helpful to people ultimately. What is helpful to people is to have them understand that there's one person um, in their corner without an agenda who's just there to support their choices and to give them information 
and access to, to, to resources and to provide support to use the information and those resources to do whatever it is they want to do. For some people, that's exploring um, controlling their drinking. Yeah, harm reduction and things exactly. like that. For, yeah. some, for some people, it's about substitution. You know, if I'm doing heroin, can I substitute alcohol and marijuana for that and reduce the risk to myself? And so we just believe fundamentally that that is the path forward for people and that people figure out what's going to work for them, uh, irrespective of whether I believe it works for me or irrespective of whether I believe it's going to work for them. It's not, that's not my job. My job is to provide this connection so that the person knows, hey, I don't have to lie to anybody about what's going on in my life. I can be completely honest with this person. And all they're going to do is tell me, here's what's available to you. Do you want to talk about how you could use these things or not use these things to improve the quality of your life, to move it in any direction that you want? And we believe once people sort of latch on to this idea that it is about them and it's about their right to make choices about their life and that they're not going to be judged by the recovery coach for the choices that they make, right. um, people start being honest. And I think that's kind of where the first few steps towards this thing that people call recovery begin. Do you know? Yeah, and actually we had a conversation with um, Gary Langus, who has been has been in this field for uh, for a long time? Um, he's a harm reduction specialist, uh, along with Chris Alba, who's at Healthy Streets. And in the middle of it, I said, you know, I was talking about recovery, kind of in a you know overall sense. And he and he said, well, what's your definition of recovery, right? And and that's another that's another one that's kind of mushy, right? And and the whole idea of um, the whole idea of safe injection sites and uh, clean needle exchanges. And yeah, just drinking on the weekends. And if if that if that if you're going, my my introduction uh, when I have my first conversation with people is generally, you know, I give them some background on on me, um, probably way more than most people would want to hear. <laughs> and um, and and then it's what do you want to do and how can I help, right? And and from right there. And what what's fascinating to me and I is. And it's probably a stupid question, but it's like, how do they know, right? Because I can, I can see it. I can see that you're, you're, you're connecting. I can see that connection just simply by being honest and talking about even brand new, right? And I mean, I hate to sound, um, you know, woo woo, but there's, there's a, there's a spiritual thing that happens there. There's a connection that happens there because when I say to someone, when they say, yeah, and I was like, you know, just hammered for a week and walking into walls, it's like, yeah, yeah. Then they, they believe me, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's a sense like, you know, and that, you know, that leads into a whole other concept that I have about just being overly sensitive and, and that most of us are, 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 you know, extremely sensitive and have a hard time with, you know, <laughs> The stuff going on around us, um, you know. I mean, I, it was definitely self-medication from the beginning for me. So, um, I I liked I liked what you said about um, because that that's an aspect that that I I knew was there, but I hadn't really thought about it in the terms that you you just talked about it, about that um, the the power dynamic, right? And that there that there isn't one involved in this relationship, right? And I'm always concerned. And we talk about this all the time at, at work and, and on the show. Is is uh, how how long it, it took them? It took them forty years to to screw up um, addictions counselors, right? Piling on regulation and paperwork and stuff like that, right? So you know, it's like I've had people like actually just about five years before this whole thing is screwed up, right? And but what I think it's going to take is is people like you that are saying the things that you're saying, right? Um, Maybe even things like this podcast that's getting to the right people, right? Getting getting people to understand right. the necessity of this and what it means, and how important it is for the community that has been marginalized for the most part. I mean, we just did a roundtable. It'll probably come out before the show, maybe maybe after the one that we're doing now, about the Long Island project, right? And that everyone, all the all the good townspeople, you know, don't want those people in there. They're they say it's traffic. Yeah. Right? They say they're worried about the traffic, but they said the same thing when they closed the methadone clinic. Right. Right? And so, you know, it's really, I don't want this in my backyard. NIMBY. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. not in my backyard. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you guys obviously do a lot of work around that, right? But is it making a dent? Uh, I think so. I mean, again, this, so you're, so 
So we're working in a field that um, that operates on a lot of assumptions that we that we just accept as fact. And I think part of what we do is we try to be uh, more circumspect about asking questions about some of these assumptions. Um, you know, or um, or we try to uh, just you know not focus on those assumptions at all and just really focus on the connection with the person. Um, like, like what? When you said the uh, assumptions that we, we a lot that we accept as fact, like well, so so the so this idea that, um, for example, that addiction is a brain disease. It is purely a brain disease. Um, as far as I know, the jury's really still out on that. Is the brain affected? Absolutely. The, the brain's affected by everything that we do, everything in our environment, and all the stimulus that we that we're exposed to every single day. Um, but some of these assumptions have uh, have stigma attached to them, right? And discriminatory thoughts and and and, and judgments attached with them that are just not helpful to people. Um, in fact, I think you know people really kind of fear being labeled in these ways, and so they resist um, these kind of honest, open connections where they can really talk about what's going on in their life, and have somebody who sits there and is committed to listening so that they can figure out where they want to go. Um, I think we, we struggle with the word recovery because of the connotations, uh, the connotations around sort of um, not just this, this sort of medical model approach to, to addiction and, and substance use, but also the medical model approach to you know, mental health challenges. And all these things are sort of intertwined, of course, right? Um, and so if, if, you know, if we're just open with people that this is about you having someone in your corner to provide support to you, to, to, to live your life the way you want to live it, to improve it in any way that's meaningful to you. Because what's meaningful to you may be different than what's meaningful to me. Abstinence is not everybody's goal, and that's fine. Um, but there's this sort of, again, there's this assumption that abstinence really should be the goal. And if you're not focused on abstinence, you're not really doing recovery coaching, which I vehemently by, by disagree the, by, with. By the clinical community, I think. Yes, yeah, exactly. I, th I think that's absolutely right. I think... Uh, uh, actually, one of the other coaches that I work with, he, he came back from from a meeting with someone. He goes, they just they just don't understand that it might not necessarily be abstinence, right? right? That they don't understand why we're not pushing abstinence, right? And and I think I think the the other part the other part of that which makes it even more interesting, is you know, a lot of people work with people in recovery, right? A lot of people have people in their family who are in recovery. They right. just don't know that they're in recovery, right? Right? We're kind of forced to out ourselves. Exactly. Well, not forced. I mean, it's a, it's a. Oh, it, we choose to, but right, yeah. but but we're outing ourselves to an industry that already looks at us like you know, and I've said this before, like we're fragile and easily triggered, or that we're going to snap at any moment, or you know, hide your wallets. <laughs> Those are the assumptions I'm talking about. <laughs> right, okay. Exactly right. right. Yeah, I think there's a there, there's an in interesting kind of um, you know almost almost every application um, or job description. Um, in any in most of the organizations, and in the definitions of what a recovery coach is, uh, there's a there's an aspect to advocacy, right? And I think I think what's misunderstood is not not only am I representing the organization um, to my as much as I hate this word to my recoveries, um, but I'm also representing recovery to the organization that I work for, right? So my my behavior and the way that I conduct myself. And the way that um, that I I represent what that means to me is I think is also is also as important um, as the job that I'm doing with with a particular individual. Absolutely. Right. So I mean, it, again, writing this this manual, it was like you know I, I came across some other ones that had been written, and it was like it was dress code, right? And there's this two pages of what you can and can't wear of you know of what of what's acceptable of i mean really condescending stuff even right. like how to act in an office right it's like they just they took us off of a bus stop and gave us this wonderful job working in their facility and now we're going to teach you how to integrate into society right. right you know dress codes and so in in my manual i decided to break it down as just that you are representing this company to the people on the outside, and you are representing recovery to the people that you work for. So you decide how you want that to be. Right. And if something comes up, we'll talk about it. <clears throat> right. So, so that's an excellent point because I, you know we we sort of look at the job as having sort of two main components. Um, 
first and foremost, there's the direct support we provide to any person that we're working with. You know, it, and obviously that's completely voluntary. We don't, we don't get assigned to work with people. We ask them if they want this kind of support and they choose yes or no, and either way is fine. And that choice remains open. Like if they choose no today, they could change their mind next week, next month, even next year. Um, and and we can provide you know, we can provide support to them, um, and that's the part of the work I think people find the most enjoyable is the direct one to one support and the relationship and the trust that develops. And, and, and there's a tremendous, as I'm sure you know, I mean, there's a tremendous affinity that develops between two people who connect on that kind of level with the kinds of experiences oh, yeah. that we have, you know, near death experiences or you know, having <laughs> lost family members or you know having lost jobs or having been incarcerated. Those are profound life experiences that you know, connect you to another human being in a way that's tough to replicate through academics. So that's the part that everybody loves, the individual support. The part that's harder, in my opinion, but is no less important is what you're, what you're alluding to, which is, um, is how do we teach people about what this is and what it means and what things are helpful to folks and what things are not helpful to folks and how do we create a different culture? So here at, here at Advocates, we, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about how can we change the culture here? How can we pay more attention to the language that people use? P people who don't ordinarily provide this kind of support or do this kind of work, but are you know, senior leaders in the organization who make you know, these profound decisions that are gonna impact the lives of lots of different people. How do we help them understand what's really helpful from the perspective of somebody who's lived it and what's not helpful? Um, and then how do we take that information and then create meaningful change in the environment so that we're not using language that's disparaging or denigrating or is going to hurt someone's esteem because that's just not helpful to a person who's trying to find their way in the world, right? We're very fond of labels, um, you know, dual diagnosis or uh, schizophrenic or, you know, drug addict or ex-con. I mean, we're really fond of using language that's sort of inherently pejorative and I think has a negative impact upon a person's uh, sort of view of themselves in relation to the world. And so why are we doing that? It's, it's not useful. It's not helpful. In fact, it's harmful. People have said that. They share that experience. So what do we need to do to change that? this sort of lack of inclusion in really important decision-making processes uh, around people's lives, people who are involved in, you know, the public systems of, uh, of uh, you know, mental health and substance use uh, recovery. Um, so how do we, you know, how do we help them to understand um, that sort of how people view themselves in the world is, is every bit as important as almost everything else you're going to do to support that person? Um, so we, you know, so we focus on um, language, on attitudes, uh, some of the things that, again, you were talking about, these sort of assumptions that we have about people who have uh, struggled with substance use and addiction. Um, how do we create warm, welcoming environments that are sort of non-judgmental, that allow people to not have to deal with additional problems on top of what they're already walking through the door with? Um, and, and that's not an easy thing to do because these assumptions run deep uh, people have these ideas about, you know, who someone who, who shoots heroin is, who they are as a human being, without ever taking the time to actually get to know this particular right. person and right. their individual well, yeah. circumstances. This idea that, you know, there are social determinants that cause people to want to escape in ways in, in which um, substance use provides a path. Right? People don't, in my experience, people don't choose to escape the world when things are going great. Well, there was an article in The New Yorker where the, the guy wrote that most people who try opioids for the first time never realize until that point how miserable they were. Exactly. Right? And that's a societal thing, right? This is, this is I, I think it's generational. I think it's societal. I think, um, I mean, you know, I could sound really old and blame it on the internet and rock music, but, you know, we don't, there's not a lot of connection going on. Right, we don't have we don't have community stores. We don't have YMCA's anymore. We don't really have Boy Scout troops and and people are having community activities. And you don't really know who your neighbors are. And you're secluded, and you're pounded with this idea that you're not good enough constantly, either through advertising or through Facebook. Right. 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 Um, and I mean, I can get really depressed looking at Facebook, not just the politics, but looking at all my friends who are saying what a wonderful life they have and how they're all driving Teslas, right? Which is all BS, right? <laughs> but then I'm going to sit there and go, oh, geez, you know, wow, I'm really, what am I doing? Right. You know, my, my little job, right? right? Now, so, you know, the, 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 wor the words matter campaigns and stuff, that always kind of um, raises the hair on the back of my neck, only, only because I've had conversations about that. And actually, when we were up in Gloucester talking to Tito Rodriguez, he, he referred to himself as an old school dope fiend, right? 
and because he referred to himself that way, right? Right. And and I don't have a problem. I have a problem with someone calling him right. an old school dope fiend, right? But I think there's also there's taking this words matter thing too far, where you're not allowing someone to be a little self-deprecating, right. right? Calling myself a drunk and an alcoholic. I mean, I did this at a board meeting where I work. You know, I said, yeah, I'm a person in long-term recovery. Yeah, that's what I'm supposed to say. But actually, I'm an alcoholic and I'm 12 years sober. And then, of course, you know, then people started to want to congratulate you or they want to hide their wallets, right? right? But my point of that was, to them at least, was I don't know that it really matters how you refer to me if the intent behind that is still junky. Right? It doesn't matter if you call me someone with a substance use disorder, if the intent and the way that you're saying it right. still says retrobate. Of course, right. right? Yep. So how do you, and this is a big question, and we're not going to be able to answer it today, but you know, how do you start to, I mean, from within, I can see it, and, it, and it's a, sometimes it's a daily struggle, and I have to remind myself and the people that I work with of, well, you know, this is an opportunity. So let's find out if we can go to their staff meeting. Let's find out if we can go talk to them. Let's let them see who we are, you know, if that's even a good idea sometimes, you know. But let's start at least on that level changing that and being, being open to that, right? But it's the bubble that they're in, right? And that's what I kind of realized is that they have this bubble where all they see is us for the first year struggling in and out of detox and stuff like that. My bubble is a room full of 100 people who are in recovery for decades right. and have good lives, right? right. So how, how do you, you know, we're, we're in a building where the, the name outside the building says advocates. So how do you begin to, to address that? Where do we go from here? Right. So, so, the, so the language thing, yeah, if, if, it's, if it's about political correctness or the word police, then it's completely ineffective as a tool to, to change what you're talking about. So what I'm talking about is, and I think people can refer to them however they, however they choose, and I, I think that's empowering. I mean, I think taking terms that are used pejoratively um, about us and sort of owning those and, and being self-deprecating about them it is a form of empowerment. Right. The queers did it. The suffragettes did it. Exactly. Yeah. I'm fine with that. All I'm suggesting is that there are ways in which we could be a lot more sensitive uh, to, to, to people um, around uh, how we think about them. And our language does, in, in, in many ways, reflect how we think about people. And we could say, well, you know, I don't mean anything or you know, no disrespect intended. But anytime you say something you know, preceded by no disrespect intended, there's a pretty good chance somebody's going to experience that as disrespectful. Yeah. I'm not talking about anyone in particular, but... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so what we're talking about is just being sensitive to the impact that language can have on people, particularly people who are sort of new to this and, um, and for whom this relationship is just starting out. You know, I think we want to do everything that we can do to be attentive to people, to be attentive to how they feel. Because I think, you know, the way in which people have felt their whole lives has led them to this to this place, right? Negatively or positively, um, it's it's led them to this place. And so, how we think about that and how we express ourselves with respect to to, to folks um, can actually change the way in which we think about people, which I think can change the way that people think about themselves. So that's one thing. This other, this other, this other mechanism is, is you know, is storytelling. The, the, the power of people sharing, um, kind of what's happened to them and how it's impacted their lives and how they've, you know, how they've come to a decision to do things differently and in all the different ways in which that occurs. It doesn't have to be. We only want to hear from people who focus on abstinence and who, you know, who got sober th and maintain their sobriety through AA or NA that kind of thing. That could be one conversation, one story. It could be somebody who's you know, whose uh, medication recovery, uh, uh, medication supported recovery could be somebody who's, you know, who's um, controlling their drinking and finding that successful for this period of time. Sharing the stories and getting to know people on a personal level, I think, is the is the tool that helps change the way we look at the larger issue of addiction and substance use. Um, it really gets to, oh, these these are complicated matters. Um, that affect people in, in in very profound ways, and there is no one size fits all solution to that. But but the one thing that we know that we can do that's that is effective is be attentive, you know, listen to people, ask what what their story is. Um, that's a that's a 
That's be a, curious. Another about re- it. another revolutionary concept. Exactly. This, I that. mean, this isn't rocket science, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I hear that all the time. It's like, oh, you guys are doing some revolutionary things over at Advocates. What listening to people yeah, and treating yeah, them yeah, like yeah, decent like, human beings? It's again, it's not rocket science. Yeah, exactly. But it's amazing how many things we do in the interest of providing help to people that don't align with those values, yeah. or have some you know, unanticipated effect on people that's, that, that's negative and, and, and harmful. And I think that's all we're saying is let's be, let's be open about having these conversations and dialoguing and not be defensive when someone says, um, you know, when you refer to someone in this way, it might be experienced by that person is hurtful. And I know that's not your intention. You, you know, I mean, I hear this all the time from, you know, from our psychiatrists and our, and our clinicians and our, you know, our, our counselors. Like, I didn't get into the field to hurt people. Yeah, that's true. I don't think anybody gets into the the, the, the field to, to harm people, but the, the reality is harm gets done anyway, right. and we've got to be uh, vigilant about it. We've got to be sensitive to the ways in which we potentially are harming per- people because it's it just gets in the way of doing the work that I think we all want to do and getting the result that we all want to get, which is to have people's lives improve such that they don't feel the need to numb themselves to the world. Um, and that's that's something that we can achieve. But in order for us to achieve it, we really have to understand the nature of the problem. And I think the only way to understand the nature of the problem is to, is to hear stories from people. Um, Pe- people who have, who have been there themselves. Yes. Yeah. 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 So how do, you st- how do you start to do that, Keith? I mean, where, do, where, does that, where does that kind of stuff begin, right? I mean... I think what's, I think what's beautiful about it is um, we, like we, don't, we don't try to... We don't try to put stories out there or put people in a position to tell stories that, that drive a particular narrative or that feed a particular agenda, because uh, that's just not useful. Um, what we try to do is get, get as many different people out there with different stories as possible so people can realize how individualized this experience is for folks and, and how individualized what's helpful for folks is. Um, that's kind of what's, what's extremely valuable. And, you know, we take every opportunity we can. We organize some in-house things here, trainings for people. We have, um, you know, recovery coaches that work here who speak and peer specialists that work here who speak and, and people in other roles who are in recovery, who, you know, who, who will voluntarily disclose and be willing to share their experience. Um, because, again, the more people I think we can sort of put out there and have them share their story, the more different perspectives you get to hear, the more your mind starts to open about what is this thing. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, I'm not an expert. I mean, I've been I've been at this for th- almost 31 years here. Um, I'm not an expert, not remotely. Um, and I think that's part of the message we want to get out there as well, is that there are lots of ideas about what's going on for people. Um, for the most part, there's some studies to suggest that this might be on to you know, a particular um, effective form of, of treatment and support or you know, that we start to learn some new things about the brain or we start to learn some new things about the, the, the impact of environment. But it, it, it impacts people very, very differently across the board. And people's recovery process is, as a result, very, very different. And I think the more we can expose people to that idea, the more they start to understand there is no sort of one size fits all and there is no sort of one explanation for this that we completely understand as the truth, right? There's, there's, there's constantly new information being revealed that's changing what we understand it about a, addiction. It was just in, in June, there was a study in, from NIH about a certain gene in the amygdala that supposedly causes alcoholism, supposedly, you know? And is that the case for every alcoholic? Right, that's the other question, right? right? It's like, okay, great. So you've tracked it down to this gene, but does everyone, does every alcoholic or every person who has alcoholism react this way because of that one particular gene, or is it just a segment of that population, right? Right. right. And and so, you know, there, I think one of one of my one of my favorite working theories is from from Elliot Dasher. He's a he's a doctor who was. There's a long story about him, but um, he, he's on Martha's Vineyard now, and he wrote this paper on alcoholism addiction and contemplation, right? Basically meditation. And this whole paper basically theorizes that all addiction is an erroneous path to spiritual awakening, right? So, so now, you, well, and, and you know, we, we, can, we can unpack that whole thing as to mm-hmm. what's addiction, what's recovery, what exactly is spirituality, what's your definition of spirituality, right? To me, it's the ability to feel okay in the present moment regardless of what's happening around me, right? That to me is, is being spiritual. And the day that you can say, I can't do this anymore, this is a spiritual awakening. I mean, it's that simple, right? 
So, you know, but you get lost in these kind of terms and what terms mean for it. It's like the recovery, right? What, is, what does recovery mean, right? And it's different for every person. And to have this idea, particularly from the medical community and the clinical community, to say that, you know, this is, we're going for abstinence, it's like, well, <laughs> good luck. Right, that might work for some folks, and it's going to not work at all for other folks. And in fact, it might even turn some people off without adequate support around it to the whole idea of recovery in the first place, um, you know, which I think is just generally not helpful. Um, I think if, if we could take a more open, open mind to, to the different kinds of experiences that people have and the different ways in which they interpret them and the things that maybe they don't even know, um, you know, like uh, Gabor Mate, his belief that sort of all addiction sort of derives from childhood trauma. Like there are people who've never heard that before, right. you know, who, who could sort of awaken to an understanding of their circumstance that's very, very different, that might lead them down a very different path. It might, you know, it might enhance the quality of their life. Um, and then they can choose a path to deal with that, you know, how, however they think that, that that needs to occur. And and that said, someone's trauma is not necessarily someone else's. Right, right? exactly. We, we all have this way of dealing with our own crap that is not necessarily, there's some people that consider what they went through traumatic. I may have gone through the exact same thing, and I'm like, what's the big deal? Yeah, and to, and to sort of not be open to the idea that... Um, kind of localizing this experience as though it just occurs in the brain chemistry sort of uh, invalidates the experience of a lot of different people, you know, who sort of who arrive at this place because of, you know, the effects of capitalism, the inability to to pay your bills, the, the stress of keeping a house over your head, the stress right. of feeding your family or educating your children or... Um, I mean, the world is an incredibly stressful place, and it feels like it's getting more stressful all the time. And we're seeing a trend. Uh, we're seeing a trend in mental illness diagnoses. It's it's going up by leaps and bounds, uh, you know, over the years. Even though, um, you know, the, the big pharmaceutical companies are you know producing these new these new drugs all the time, um, mental illness is moving in the wrong direction. More people being diagnosed than ever before. More people applying for disability than ever before. More people overdosing than ever before. More people escaping. Um, that's not just about a brain disease. That's a, that's about a society and a culture that's 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 pr producing this effect in people, um, and it's you know in some people it's affecting more than others. And I think that's kind of when you have to start to look at issues related to oppression and marginalization and, and groups that traditionally don't get the kind of help that they need because they've not had access to the same resources. You know, people of color, people for whom English is a second language, people with physical disabilities, people with, you know, psychiatric and, and developmental and intellectual disabilities. These are all marginalized groups who don't get treated the same. But what's interesting is, and I think you and I are are in the same decade of, of era anyway. Um, I, I don't know. Um, but the, the rate of suicide right now among um, particularly men in their 50s and 60s, right, has gone up exponentially. And the rate of overdose and the rate of alcoholism. I mean, a lot of this, a lot of the coaching was started and came about to address the opioid crisis. But I'd say 70% of the people that are referred to me are, are alcohol. And so this has been, you know, it's, it's, it's a real shock. And you have a situation in the medical community where, you know, well, we're not, and I'm not really, I'm not quoting anyone in particular. I'm just, I'm, I'm wildly speculating. It's like, we don't really ask about that because we don't have an answer to it. Right? We don't. We up until now we've had no way to address that. So why would I ask? Right? And it's right. also really taboo. Right? You don't. Oh, it's none of your business. Right? Yep. And and so you know, getting getting back to what what you were talking about is this this idea that you know we we do we have a, a unbelievably stressful um, societally stressful. Going back to my earlier comment of most people who have tried opioids for the first time never realize until that point how miserable they were. We have a higher rate of suicide. Um, we have that, and then we have that study that um, that came out a couple years ago from Harvard, where they tracked. You know, it was men because only men were at Harvard at the time, but I think it was a 60-year or 50-year study of 
guys who had graduated from school, and they followed them for the next 50 years. And they found that the guys that were actually the happiest were the ones that had, you know, long-term relationships with buddies and had families and kids and had community around them. And, and the guys that maybe were making the most money and were stressed out about and working in Wall Street were ready to jump off a bridge, right? And so going back to exactly what you said, which is like, really? This is a shock, right? You know, it's like, well, oh, you're doing revolutionary things. No, I'm talking. I'm talking to people, and I'm listening to them, and I'm saying, let me help you get where you want to go. Right. You know, I mean, I always add a little something. He's like, well, I, I see a guy in the hospital who just almost drank himself to death, and he goes, you know, I want to try some controlled drinking. I'm like, well, here, why don't you keep my card so you can call me the next time you're in the ER, right? But by all means, you know, give give it a shot, and let's let's see how that works. Right. And we'll continue to have the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think what's kind of interesting, um, sort of about how we how we've arrived at this place. Um, so there are those who would argue that the opioid crisis really only became a crisis when it started to impact um, young white women. Um, the color of the landscape changed. Families of affluence, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, prior to that, plenty of people were dying from opioid overdoses, but you know if they were brown or black or poor, it wasn't considered a nationwide crisis, right? So I think um, we have to really consider some of these kind of more social issues as being fundamental to this, to this question of, you know, how do you provide support around people recovering? What does that really mean? What does addiction mean? Um, and sort of start to parse these things out in a way that, again, sort of informs more people rather than less people about sort of how complex this issue is um, and how many different perspectives and interpretations of these experiences there are out there and how many things that people find really, really helpful. Some people find meditation, yoga, incredibly helpful, diet, incredibly helpful. Other people are not going to go in that direction and shouldn't feel compelled to go in that direction because it may not work for them. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what's so beautiful about sort of the, the recovery coaching idea in its purest form is it, it allows for people to believe what they want to believe, to interpret their experience in a way that's meaningful for them. Because at the end of the day, you know, when you're alone in your house um, trying to figure your way through a problem, um, it's really only helpful if you've got the confidence in your ability to do that. A lot of this rest, the rest of this stuff doesn't sort of matter as much in, in those circumstances. But how you get to that place, I think, is really, really important. You know, letting people know that you know, folks come through this stuff all the time, stronger than before, uh, more resilient than before, and able to be of service to other people um, in a way that maybe they didn't feel like they were previously. And I think all of those things, you know, are part of this kind of healing process that people kind of find on their own. Again, if they have someone who can just say, I'm with you here, however you want to do this. Right, I mean, right. what's most important is that it's it's about you and the choices that you're making, what you learn from them and how you grow from them. Because um, I think that's ultimately how people kind of get on this path. I, I, had, a, I had a couple questions I, I wanted to ask you, and we talked about it before, but we're, we're actually, believe it or not, we're coming up on an hour. Um, and I know you had probably a limited amount of time. Um, and maybe maybe we can um, maybe we can do this again and talk because I'd really like to kind of talk about supervision. But I had one question in particular because it's come up at several of the recovery coach commissions. It's this question about about the difference between a sponsor and a recovery coach, and it comes up time and time and time again. And I, of course, I'm I'm a you know I'm highly negative, and my immediate reaction is is well you're just trying to figure out is why should we pay you when there are perfectly free sponsors available, yeah. right? But it's come up. It's come up at two, two or three different commissions, right? I, I have my own answer that I actually wrote to the commission and to Governor Baker's office and to BSAS. Um, but I, how would how would you answer that question? Well, I think first of all, I, sponsorship is non-professional, right? Um, and I think sponsorship is oriented around a, a very specific way of interpreting a person's experience and and assisting them in accessing what what the sponsor believes is helpful. I think it generally, my experience has been that it tends to be a lot more prescriptive, uh, that people will sort of look at your situation and, um, and say, here's what I think you need to do, and here's what was helpful to me, and you know, this kind of idea, if you want what I have, then do what I did, uh, that, that kind of idea. And I think it's a, it's a lot more hands-on. Um, you know, our, our recovery coaches are not available to people 24-7. Like, you know, you work with folks during the day and you need to have a private life when you go home. 
Um, I think sponsors tend to make themselves a lot more available. I think just fundamentally, I think recovery coaches are more open to a, a myriad of ways in which people can move their life forward in a positive direction. Um, they're, they're not attached to a specific narrative or a specific approach. Um, they're, they're not sort of acculturated to sort of rattle off the, the, the sort of things that sponsors um, uh, will, will generally share with folks, you know, about you know, things like um, being constitutionally incapable of living a life that demands rigorous honesty, you know, like that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in recovery coaching, but I think part of what's so valuable about it is it's sort of not dispensed in the same way. Um, it's, 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 not a, um, it's not a set of directions to follow. It's more, I believe that fundamentally you have some internal wisdom about what's best for you. My job is to support you to feel confident to tap into that. My job is to be knowledgeable about information and resources that could be helpful as you sort of navigate your path. And then how you do that is completely up to you. And I'm gonna not you know, be judgmental and I'm gonna be supportive. And if you fall down, that's okay. It's, that's all part of the process. Um, so for me, that's kind of the fundamental difference. Does I, that make sense? I, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. I would, I would add to that in that a, a recovery coach um, is held to uh, policies and ethics of the organization that they work for. The sponsors are not, yeah. And, and that they also have the resources of that organization, the organization for which they work available to them. Yep. Right. So PCPs and therapy and um, medically assisted treatment and um, other coaches and supervisors and people like you that can help mentor and answer questions and that, you know, if you and I were working together, I would be able to come to you and go, Keith, listen, I, I, I have no idea what to do with this guy, right? Where you, you don't you don't have, and I, I think I think that particular question, only because it's been asked, and, and my kind of concern as to why it's being asked, um, really needs a better answer to the commission as far as, you know, th there's a lot more to this than, than you're seeing or than maybe you want to know, but we're going to jam it down your throat anyway. Right. right? I, I think the definition that you just gave is probably one of the better ones that I've heard. Because yeah, there, isn't, there isn't really any oversight in, in terms of sponsorship. Right? Sponsors can generally act the way sponsors want to act. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's nobody sort of watching them, supervising them, saying that's not part of the role, that's not part of the code of ethics. Um, and so there's a lot more information that can be shared that's not necessarily helpful. There's actually harm that can be done by, by sponsors who sort of overstep and um, are giving people advice and counseling people in ways in, in which they're not qualified to do. Um, and I think all of those things are, are, are risky. On the positive side, um, those kinds of relationships transcend professionalism and they're, they're not, you know, they're not dictated by, you know, insurance companies being willing to fund them. And, you know, and I think, um, uh, there are many, many, many people I know that would, you know, would say that the, their relationship with their sponsor was instrumental in saving their life and bringing them to this path of recovery that they're on. So I'm not saying sponsorship is bad. I think it's a great thing, but it is very different than recovery coaching, um, which I think has a lot more oversight built into it. If somebody starts doing something that's antithetical to the role of recovery coach and they're employed, you know, we can do something about that through supervision and training and progressive discipline and even sort of termination that it's not the right job for you to do. Um, that's, that's much, much harder to do with, uh, with sponsorship uh, because again, it's, it's inherently non-professional, which has tremendous upside, but also has problems associated with it. I also think that I think in some cases there's a there's a power dynamic too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right, which uh, yeah is not what what we're what we're looking at. I mean, I, I don't I don't know. I think that may have occurred to me prior to this conversation, but it just kind of just kind of there, there actually there actually is. You right. Know, I've got the answers. You know, if you want these answers, you got to come to me. You know that kind of thing. Uh, depending on who you're talking to, and I think I talked to one of those people for about eight years. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sort of sit down and shut up, you don't really know anything kind of approach to right. <laughs> right. how you learn to be sober. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, listen, this is probably, um, I, I did I did want to talk to you about supervision, but I, I think both of us are, are kind of crunched for time. Would you, would you be willing to do this again? And, and, oh, yeah, and absolutely. Make, okay, this is, this is great. This yeah. is great. This is a good place to end, too, so. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Like, to, to your earlier question about sort of how do you, you know, how do you change the way culture 
society, employers think about this stuff. This is one of the ways now that you know people are tapping into you know podcasts and radio broadcasts and YouTube videos that they can access in the privacy of their own home to learn more about other perspectives on these issues. So I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. So thank you. Well, th thanks for coming on. There's there's one question I like to ask everyone, and that's um, is there anything that uh, that you wished I'd asked you that I didn't? No, I don't think so. Okay. All right, Keith Scott. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me.